Welcome back to the Super Turbo 28. Last time we discovered that this budget sidecar accelerator for the Amiga 500, well this is faulty. When plugged into the machine all you get is a black screen. Now I have since discovered that this was purchased from Ami Bay. It's not mine by the way, it belongs to another local Amiga enthusiast. But he bought it from Ami Bay knowing it was faulty. But over there it was sold under the guise of possibly having a bad clock. Well, last time we were able to prove that the oscillator in here, that's fine. It is producing its 28.5 MHz clock and that is making its way over to the CPU. And speaking of said chip, we were also able to confirm that it is good because, well, we removed it and tested it in another accelerator. In there, the machine sprang to life. That's booting fine. No issues there. So, yeah, not the CPU. So we didn't find anything obviously wrong inside here. Although that said, the two Tigram ICs, they were getting very hot. One of them in particular was almost going nuclear. You could hardly touch it. So since that last video, I have ordered two replacements. They are here and we will try fitting them shortly. But at the end of the last video, I also asked if any of you guys had any suggestions of something else to try. So there were some fantastic suggestions that came in. For example, Music Molehead, well, they reckon that this accelerator might only work in an A500. We have been using an A500 Plus because it may be looking for Kickstart 1.2 or 1.3. So one very grubby looking A500, this is a Rev 6 in here with Kickstart 1.3. But with the Super Turbo 28 connected, and if we flick the power switch, well, as you can see, it's still just producing that black screen. So no, that doesn't seem to be the case, does it? It's still not working in there. And indeed, in reply to that comment, Kim Shakey, well, they have confirmed that their Super Turbo it works fine in their A2000 with Kickstart 3.1.4. There was then a comment from Proton Jinx, who noticed that one of the surface mount resistors on here, it looked a little bit discoloured, so possibly faulty. That has 471 written on top of it, so 47 times 110, so 470 ohms. And yeah, that's close enough. The majority of the rest of them are all 3.3k, apart from that one up there, which is 200 ohms. But all, all of the surface mount resistors, they all read fine. All those surface mount capacitors, well, none of them are shorted. So you'd have to assume they're all fine as well. And then Venturi Life, well, they recommended that we maybe should have reflowed all the contacts associated with this slot connector here. But I have tried doing that and unfortunately it still just produces a black screen. So last time when we were in here we also checked the reset signal coming to the CPU and that was working fine. Starting low, going high. But there was also a couple of other comments asking us to take a look at the halt signal. That should equally start low, go high and stay high. If there is indeed something going wrong in there, if the CPU is getting a bit of code that it doesn't like or something it doesn't understand, it should in theory halt itself and that will crash the system. That halt pin should go low. So before we do anything else, how about we plug this into the Amiga and uh, test that. So it was both Stephen White and Black Cat Hardware that suggested we check the halt pin but Black Cat Hardware, he also suggested that we take a look at the BERR signal or the bus error signal. So both of those are present on this side of the chip here. Reset, which we looked at last time, that is on pin 20. And we can view its operation here on the scope. Power on, waits a second, goes high and stays high. So let's take a look at HALT. First of all, it is on pin 19, just beside that one. And we should see the same behaviour. So yeah, started low for a split second, has went high, and it is staying high. So the CPU is not 
halted. What about that bus error signal then? That is on pin 24. Again, this is an active low signal. And that is just staying high. So no bus errors to speak of. One thing I have noticed though, taking a quick probe around this, and I did mention this last time. So if we take a look down here somewhere on the address bus, well that is absolutely dead as Hector. There is nothing happening there. And if you take a look on the data bus, well, it is floating. That's sitting at 1.42 volts. All of the data bus is sitting there. And I think that is the case. Because if we look over here at pin 9, this is the read write pin. And that is high. And that just stays high. There is no activity on that. From the moment the power is applied, it is high. So that is the CPU trying to do a read, presumably out of the ROM. But if we take a look at the two pins beside this, pin 7 and 8, we have the upper data strobe and the lower data strobe. And both of those are high as well. And then if we take a look at this 68,000 technical data sheet, it describes the upper and lower data strobe, UDS and LDS. And where both of those are high, and in fact it doesn't really matter what the read-write pin is doing, but when both UDS and LDS are high, that means there is no valid data on any of the data bus. So does that make sense? Is that why our data bus is floating? Although I think what is probably happening is that this is making a write request through these things or two uh, PLDs and it may well be the case that there is a fault in there and that write request to the ROM isn't getting any further the whole system is just hanging although I suppose what I secretly hope is the case here what is happening is that our PLDs are involving the TIGRAM chips here that TIGRAM chip I can hardly touch that is screaming hot Ah, so is that one as well actually. The two of them, they are way too hot. So the only thing that's going to make them get like that is if they are shorted internally, if they have failed. But we do have our two replacement ICs for the two Tigran. So how about we just try swapping them out. But if these are indeed faulty, here's a thought. I wonder what this would do with these chips removed. Would it show any more signs of life? So is that going to make any difference with the Tigram chips missing? Nope. It's still just a black screen. And to be honest with you, I think that is more or less now confirming that the fault is indeed within the PLDs. Let's go ahead and try fitting the two new Tigram chips. And fingers crossed we get a little more activity out of it. So I have fully intended showing you the fitment of this chip at position IC8. But guess who forgot to hit record. So let's instead go through the fitment of the chip at position IC9. So on the silk screen you can see the marking for pin 1 there, it is that dot in the top right hand corner as we're looking at it. And equally on the package itself, there is a dot on the IC just there, that is pin 1, and that needs lined up as such. Now if there is one type of surface mount soldering that I do not like doing, it is this type. I absolutely suck. At soldering these packages on which the legs bend down in underneath the chip. But we're just trying to get one pin tacked down to start with and you can see I have swapped out to a smaller tip on the iron. And as you can see I've managed to move the bloody thing. So yeah, that's a bit of a nasty blob, but it will do for holding the chip in position for now. And it is certainly attached in that corner. 
Let's spin things around and try to do the opposite corner. So a bit more flux. And can I get this one down? And yeah, I think that's us. It's attached. The orientation of it looks pretty good. So let's just try and do all the other legs. Yeah, that's probably way too much flux. But as I said, I suck at soldering these packages. So the more flux, the better, as far as I'm concerned. And the reason I'm using the smaller tip here is to try and get in at that junction between the leg and the pad. And I think that's pretty good there, other than those couple of solder bridges. We should be able to deal with those easily enough. There's one away. And I think that's the other one away. Spin back round to the other side. And let's just do the same again. Or try to anyway, because so far I am making a complete hash of this. All cleaned up, but while I was at this, while the solder and arm was out, I decided to just reflow around IC10 here, around this PLD as well. Because while I will keep my fingers crossed that fitting the two new cache tag RAM chips will make the difference, I think ultimately what is going on here is a failure in either of these two. But we've had that off before and refitted it. So why not just reflow around that one while the iron was hot? Are we going to see anything different? Power on? No. Still just a black screen. So I'm afraid I'm just going to have to once again call defeat. I am pretty much convinced now that the fault is within one of the two PLDs or perhaps maybe even both of them have gone bad. But unfortunately without the code to try and write on two new PLDs, well there isn't really anything else that I can do. Now you might say that if I try desoldering the two chips that are on there maybe I could try and read out the code that's in them and then try and write that to something new. Well that would be dependent on whether the security bit on them is set. If that is set it would stop them being read out. Uh, considering that the markings of some of the chips in here were scrubbed off to try and hide the identity of them making this thing harder to reverse engineer well I would be very very surprised if that security bit isn't actually set. Of course even to try and read that out well I would need a compatible programmer some device that can read the contents of those chips or write to them but I don't have such a thing. My TL866, well, it can't do it. And in fact, doing a quick bit of Googling, it seems that the only devices out there that will do it would cost me in the region of three to four hundred pounds. And let's just say I'm not that desperate to try and get this thing working again. While it was apart though, well, I did try plugging that connector, plugging that into that breakout board I have for the A500. That allows you to use A2000 accelerators. Well, if we try and plug this in here. As you can see, it still does nothing. And indeed, while it was apart, I noticed what might have been a little bit of damage on the bottom side. At this position here and here, it almost looked as if this coating on top of the traces, as if this was damaged. So, I speculated, could that possibly be a break in a trace underneath that? Could that be the cause of our problem? Now you can see there that I have exposed a little bit of the copper just at that point. Same here. And following this trace back to Avia at this point, I have scratched off a little bit of the coating just to expose some copper there. But no, that trace tastes fine throughout its full length from that point up here to that position onto there and finally where it appears somewhere over here on the edge connector. So no issue there although I'm not really sure what caused 
that sort of damage to the conformal coating. Possibly just the amount of heat I had to put into the board to get those new Tigram chips soldered on. Now since the last video I got an email from a guy called Arnie who sent me some schematics and a bit of a write up for a similar device for the Atari ST. Now both that machine and the Amiga they're both based around the 68k processor so the two cache accelerator cards are probably not that much different. Well I say that the one for the ST uses a couple of gals in place of the PLDs that are on this one but the basic principle of how they work is probably something similar. I'm thinking back to the problems that we've seen on this with the oscilloscope I think one of the key issues in here is coming back to that UDS and LDS signals, that upper data strobe and the lower data strobe, because without either of those being asserted, the CPU is not going to complete a read. And that's what it's doing when it's first powered on, isn't it? It's trying to read the initial code out of the ROM. It's just not doing that. Now, in the Amiga, those signals are only present on the CPU, Gary, and the edge connector, which is obviously how it makes its way out to this thing. But within this, they must be routed through one of those PLDs, much like they are on the Atari ST's accelerator. As you can see on this schematic, they go through a GAL, a position IC7. So yeah, I think that is where the problem lies. But as I said, without the equations to put into the PLDs, and without any means of reading or writing to those chips, yeah, we're just beat. Now Arnie did provide a very detailed write-up of how the Atari ST version of this would work. It's a little too detailed for me to go into now, but what I'll do is put a pinned comment down below so anyone interested can read it. And then equally on the comments of the last video, Clay Cowgill, well they responded to say that they used to work for Supra and remember the development of this very board. So again, they've provided a little bit of a write-up there. It's a bit too much detail just to go into now, but I will add it to that pinned comment down below. So if you're interested, you can give it a read. But for now, and for the purposes of this video, yeah, I'm sorry, but we're beat. There's nothing else I can do other than put it back in its box and get this thing back to Alan. It's not really heavy enough to make a paperweight from, but at least it is a good conversation piece. That's going to be it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.